Welcome to Shook Cover Loop, where we squeeze the bigger picture of literature. I'm Adrian Fort, and uh, we are here for what will be a bit of an unconventional video in the uh, poetry discussion playlist here on the channel. Uh, something a bit broader. Uh, this will not be a discussion of a single poem. This will be a discussion about a concept around poetry. Um, sort of a meta-concept with poetry, if you will. I wanted to talk a little bit about the idea of home base poems. Uh, it's something I've never heard of, but it's something that I refer to with myself. And uh, really, I'm making this video for a bit of a selfish reason. If you have spent any number of uh, minutes in any of the poetry playlists here on the channel, the poems that I am presenting in this video will not surprise you. So, I'm going to put it out there now. You don't have to watch. Uh, what I'm going to be prompting for as far as participa participation is concerned is that I would like you to leave in the comments for me your home base poems. Um, this is an idea that it took me a while to realize that I do. Um, so, for example, I've got five poems here, and we'll see if we get to all of them. I'm not sure. These are poems to which I will return time and time again. Uh, poems to which I will look for inspiration to which I will look for clarity to which I will look for discernment to which I will look for direction these are poems that I utilize for myself that I use in very selfish fashions and I hope we all have poems like that I hope that um, if you I'm willing to bet that if you are someone who takes poetry seriously, and if you're not, why would you be here on this video? But I'm willing to bet that you do, in fact, have poems like this. Maybe you've just not thought of it in this way. It took me a while to realize that this is what I do. We'll start, of course, with Emily Dickinson. Um, I died for beauty. Here on two, six, page 216 of the complete poems of Emily Dickinson. I know it was backwards there. Um, don't argue with me. 260, what am I doing here? I'm flabbergasted. I died for beauty, but was scarce adjusted in the tomb, when one who died for truth was lain in an adjoining room. He questioned softly why I failed. For beauty, I replied, and I, for truth. Themself are one, we brethren are, he said. And so, as kinsmen met a knight, we talked between the rooms until the moss had reached our lips and covered up our names. Why do I return to this poem? To, um, for myself, the reason that I come back to I died for beauty, I come back to I died for beauty for intellectual reasons mostly this is for me a philosophical poem it is a poem about truth about beauty it is a poem about art it is a poem about there's the old phrase from martin luther king jr i believe a man who has nothing for which he would die is not fit to live, I believe. That's uh, Martin Luther King Jr. This is that same sentiment on the latter half of the poem. And it is something, I think that these are fundamental philosophical questions. Do you have something for which you would die? And are you fit to live? Uh, so when I am in meeting of a philosophical spark, uh, this is this is what I go to. This is my go-to. The next poem, still from Emily Dickinson. So there's three Emily Dickinson and two Bukowski. 
The next Emily Dickinson <clears throat> is poem 508 from page 247. I'm seated. I've stopped being theirs. The name they dropped upon my face with water in the country church is finished using now. And they can put it with my dolls. My childhood and the string of spools I finished threading too. Baptized before without the choice, but this time consciously of grace. Unto supremest name called to my full the crescent dropped, existence's whole arc filled up with one small diadem. My second rank, too small the first, crowned, crowning on my father's breast. A half unconscious queen, but this time adequate, erect, with will to choose or to reject, and I choose just a crown. This is a poem to which I will return from time to time when <clears throat> I say oftentimes that I am a free speech absolutist. I say oftentimes that um, the, meaning is, uh, the meaning of life is the meaning which we construct. I think that that is one of the uh, hallmarks of what it means to, to claim oneself an atheist. I think that you have to believe that there is meaning to life and that meaning to life is constructed by the individual. So individuality is the um, individuality is existence manifest. And I think that this poem helps me when I am. Um, I think we all lose. We all get muddled down from time to time, I think. In the banality of life in the banal in the uh, workaday in the fact that you go to work and you are a number your license states that you are a number you go to uh, you've got a social security number you have a phone number these things are individualized but not individuality and uh for me, I am someone who is prone to beating myself down and grinding out into that um, sense of nobodiness. I'm nobody. Who are you? Ironically, is not on this list. But um, that 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 feeling of um, the feeling of the humdrum beating upon you, the feeling of being the humdrum only to be beaten upon. I think that's, I like that. The feeling of being the humdrum only to be beaten upon is something to which I am particularly prone from time to time. And this poem, I'm seated. I've stopped being theirs. I think that's super powerful. That is something that uh, I really enjoy. And that j just that statement, if you were to take it as an incantation, uh, I think would necessarily hold some type of power um power which i'm seated i've stopped being theirs you almost can't say it without being um erect like she says later in the poem uh, so this is a poem that i found uh i believe within the last calendar year and has already become very important to me. The next one that I'm going to go to from Emily Dickinson. Um, yeah, we're doing great with time. We're fine. Is from page 312. Poem number 632. The brain is wider than the sky. For put them side by side. The one the other would contain with ease. And you beside. The brain is deeper than the sea, for hold them blue to blue, the one the other would absorb, as sponges, buckets do. The brain is just the weight of God, for heft them pound for pound, and they will differ if they do, as syllable from sound. So, I died for beauty, but was scarce adjusted in the tomb. 
that puts me in sort of a, a, a Nietzsche, Nietzsche mindset where I really want to delve deep into words, what they represent, and how those things transpose onto one psychology, uh, on one state of being. That's how I sort of describe what that poem does to me. This poem, I'm a really big fan of Einstein. There's a painting of him on that wall, and I've got a drawing of Kurt Vonnegut over here that I did in high school because Kurt Vonnegut sort of looked like uh, Einstein. Uh, that was before I ever knew who Kurt Vonnegut was. But um, this poem really, one of the inspiring things about Einstein, and you really should read Walter Isaacson's uh, biography of Einstein if you have not, um, even if you are just a fan of, if you were here because you were a fan of literature, uh, but not necessarily history or science or any of that, because Einstein, his brain truly was wider than the sky. Um, he, he, he was someone who said, who came along and was willing to say, I see your terms. And all of your math checks out. Um, but I think you're wrong. And here's why. And that is something that has been truly inspiring to me in my life. And so Emily Dickinson stating these same things, these same sentiments from which Einstein seems to have participated in his scientific life the way Emily Dickinson states these things uh, reminds me that that same mindset can be put to work in a writerly fashion in a writerly sense uh, part of what had happened to me in grad school which um, I don't think it's unusual, is that when the craft itself is emphasized, the imagination itself uh, is de-emphasized. And no one's going to train you to be more imaginative. It's just not going to happen. So when you get into a situation like grad school where You've got 10 people in the same room paying tens of thousands of dollars to learn how to be a writer. If you got there without imagination, sorry, sucker. Um, your checks still better cash. That's not going to do you any help. So uh, not going to do you any good. So what they try to do is they try to preach all of the craft, which I, I can understand that. You know, I can understand that. But what it does is it regularizes it waters down, it puts a whole lot of flour in the cookie. And it, it's a little bit distasteful from the level where it forces you to play by someone else's rules, which if you're in grad school for creative writing, that's really not your personality, right? That's not what you're there for. So this poem is something to which I will return from time to time in order to really reinvigorate that sense of the fact that writing is imagination first, uh, which is funneled through the craft. And a statement so broad as the brain is wider than the sky is not only beautiful, is not only true, but is in fact an illustration of the fact that writing itself, that um, my aspirations as a writer um, may be fruitless if you were using the world's definition of fruit. That does not make them unproductive. That does not make them useless, I think. Um, so those are the Emily Dickinson poems.
the Bukowski poems are the following. The first comes to us from The Pleasures of the Damned. It is on page 545, The Bluebird. There's a bluebird in my heart that wants to get out, but I'm too tough for him. I say, stay in there. I'm not going to let anybody see you. There's a bluebird in my heart that wants to get out, but I pour whiskey on him and inhale cigarette smoke. And the whores and the bartenders and the grocery clerks never know that he's in there. There's a bluebird on, in my heart that wants to get out, but I'm too tough for him. I say, stay down. Do you want to mess me up? Do you want to screw up the works? You want to blow up? You want to you want to blow my book sales in Europe? There's a bluebird in my heart that wants to get out, but I'm too clever. I only let him out at night sometimes. When everybody's asleep, I say, I know that you're there, so don't be sad. Then I put him back, but he's singing a little in there. I haven't quite let him die, and we sleep together like that, with our secret pact, and it's nice enough to make a man weep, but I don't weep. Do you? That is a poem. Um, Along with getting run down and um, falling, falling into the humdrum of life, I'm also super guilty of forgetting my own humanity, of dehumanizing myself, of um, tearing myself down to the point where I, 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 I'm just, I feel like putty, right? Um, where I don't feel worthwhile. And I feel um, less than. And that's a poem that reminds me that uh, you can look at yourself that way. Hell, others probably look at you that way. But that's okay. You're still human, whether you want to be or not. And you can be misunderstood and you can uh, be not the nicest and you can be yourself um, you can hear my neighbor can't you these walls are like vellum paper but uh this is a poem to which i return in order to restore my humanity from time to time uh, to remember that there is something, there is something inside. There is something inside. The next poem is as well from Charles Bukowski, but it is from <clears throat> Literature, a portable anthology, second edition, How Bland a Name Can You Have for a Really Good Collection of Literature. The poem is titled My Old Man. Where is it here? Where'd I go? Lost it. What page is it on? 597. Going the wrong direction. Sixteen years old during the Depression. I'd come home drunk and all my clothing, shorts, shirts, stockings, suitcase, and pages of story, short stories would be thrown about the front lawn and about the street. My mother would be waiting behind a tree. Henry. Henry, don't go in. He'll kill you. He's read your stories. I can whip his ass. Henry, please take this and find yourself a room. But it worried him that I might not finish high school, so I'd be back again. One evening, he walked in with pages of one of my short stories, which I had never submitted to him. And he said, this is a great short story. I said... 
Okay. And he handed it to me, and I read it. It was a story about a rich man who had a fight with his wife and had gone out into the night for a cup of coffee and had observed the waitress and the spoons and the forks and the salt and pepper shakers and the neon sign in the window and then had gone back to his stable to see and touch his favorite horse when who then kicked him in the head and killed him. Somehow the story held meaning for him though. When I had written it, I had no idea of what I was writing about. So I told him, okay, old man, you can have it. And he took it and walked out and closed the door. I guess that's as close as we ever got. Uh, this is a poem I return to from time to time because I've, I've told this story several times on the channel now. It's a poem that I read in passing during class when we were supposed to be talking about a different poem, I believe. And uh, the conversation was not particularly compelling, so I went ahead and started reading different poems. And I came across that one. And I thought it was stupid. I thought it was dumb. What, what a boring poem. How, how mundane. And I left the class, and a couple days later, I started thinking about that poem. How much it reminded me of myself. And kept thinking about it and thinking about it. I couldn't remember what it was. I couldn't remember what poem it was. And um, I kept searching through the book, searching through the book. And I thought, you know... We read it in class, so I kept asking everybody and asking everybody, what poem was that? What poem was that? What poem was that? Uh, but it wasn't. Nobody knew. I kept saying, you know, that's the one about the, the guy and the, the dad was real mad and, you know. And nobody knew because we didn't read it in class. We didn't read it for class. I read it in class when we were supposed to have read something else for class. Um, but it reminded me so much of... of adolescence and all that you know and um it's a poem to which i return from time to time because i need it i when i say home-based poem that really is a home-based poem for me um something to which i return time and again because it feels like home so that's it those are the poems that i have and i hope you share with me uh, your home-based poems and um, the reasons for which you return to those poems because um, I, I think that communicating like that is is helpful and maybe you'll introduce me to a new poem and a poem to which I will return time and again.